You are not so great, Britain. Chapter 7. British Universities. Are they really so great? Hello, uh, my name is Tomasz Olinski and you're listening to yet another chapter of You Are Not So Great Britain. Our guest today is uh, Professor Jan Czulik, uh, who is a lecturer in Czech uh, at the School of Modern Languages and Cultures in Glasgow University. Hello. Hello. I wanted to discuss uh, with you British universities uh, because uh, they have such a great legendary opinion about being the best and they are doing really well with all those uh, rankings and everything. And of course, everybody knows the names like Oxford or Cambridge, but if you look at, like, say, most recent prime ministers of Britain who are all, I think, Oxford educated, you may have a feeling that this education is not really the greatest. So tell me, are really the British universities so great or they just are going on this opinion that they gained over many years and we just haven't noticed the recent changes? Well, um the British universities have one great advantage, which is basically that it uses the English language, right? So, of course, that in in the first place is a kind of uh, springboard for internationalism, and uh, of course, it is much more um, sort of makes everything fairly easy to actually uh, do international research cooperation, um, publishing stuff in international uh, ag- academic journals, doing research. So, so this, this, is, this, is a, this is a great advantage. And I would actually... Yeah, I, I think if I, if I may, maybe, may in, it is, will I be correct to say that if you are a lecturer in Czech on a British university, all your publications or most of them will be default in English? So you will be quoted much often, but by other world universities that study Slavic languages than someone who publishes in Czech only. Well, yes. Or that's... Uh, first things first, let's get back to that. Uh, but let me feel, uh, 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 con- continue a little bit along, along this, uh, uh, where, where I was there, basically. I wanted to say that, basically, I think that primarily, as a result of the fact that the British universities use English as the sort of language of communication, this is one of the things why it kind of is fairly high up in various hierarchies, in various kind of uh, uh, sort of uh, polls or co- co- assessment of how how they do um, in various assessment and comparison. So, so this is this is one one important thing. However, there is a major problem, which is uh, some years ago already, British politicians uh, introduced, probably under the influence of the situation in the United States, student fees. And uh, while in some other European countries, let's think of Germany, for instance, but even various countries of uh, sort of new europe countries like say czech republic or even poland where universities are funded by the state but actually the united states uh, and the united uh, kingdom have made this conscious decision that actually universities shouldn't be state funded but while they are kind of partially state funded nevertheless Universities do have to survive by uh, relying on uh, student fees. And of course, in England, I'm talking to you from Scotland, the situation is slightly different. Uh, In England, the the, uh, student fees are really quite uh, exorbitant. It's uh, about £9,000 per year. And actually, for people from abroad now, it really goes over, I mean, almost, almost double the, uh, the thing. And the, I would argue that actually the fact that uh, the British universities have been forced to actually 
go on a kind of commercial basis. This is really a problem. It has really kind of damaged the British university system because even though uh, there's a lot of propaganda within UK universities, academics talking about excellence and good uh, results of uh, independent research and all that, nevertheless, in spite of saying all this, what is of necessity primary is the commercial aspect, the management based on those student fees. And the universities are basically forced in the United Kingdom to shape whatever they are doing to attract as large as possible influx of, uh, of money. And so basically, I could even say maybe provocatively, yeah that the universities in the United Kingdom are not really free because they are kind of enslaved by this commercial aspect. Primarily, they are doing basically what uh, is uh, sort of determined by money. Yeah, that, that's that's what I was I wanted to ask because if, as you look at the universities, they because, as you said, they are basically private enterprises that need to find themselves in this market economy they are not answering to the real needs of the state, but instead they are just like money-making enterprises. And if you look at the offer of these universities, you got plenty of those engineering or business management uh, studies that are uh, drawing all, for example, people from China uh, who come and study here because uh, they are paying a lot of uh, money to get a business a diploma from uh, a British university. But the uh, subjects that are really needed are underfunded. And I've been to a conversation with someone years ago who said that Britain, it, it was discussing about Brexit and how the influx of Eastern European into Britain uh, was one of the reasons why people voted for it. And this uh, man told me that it's because we had no idea how many people from Eastern Europe would like to come to Britain after we opened the borders. And that's what the universities are for. They are the studies of, of various countries and cultures, and those academics should be able to tell you uh, what to expect uh, because they would be sitting and researching and studying these nations. And uh, meanwhile, you, as 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 uh, employee of this uh, school of modern languages and cultures, you were fighting for a survival of this uh, institute because it was deemed uh, probably not economically viable because you don't attract many foreign students paying this high. Fees and uh, as that, you are not so great uh, business for the university, and well, this leads to 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 this like uh, the directions of research and teaching to like diverging from the real needs of the country. Can I say that? Well, um, as I'm saying, this commercialism of of the UK universities certainly sort of cast over the shadow over. Uh, which topics uh, basically the universities uh, are concerned with. And uh, at the beginning of this uh, conversation, you were mentioning the fact that uh, I uh, was in a lecture basically uh, dealing with uh, Czech studies. Now, Brexit, of course, is a, a problem also, uh, which has kind of dealt a real blow against the United Kingdom because quite, quite paradoxically, the pro-Brexit politicians... Um, have been uh, talking about how Britain will be uh, totally global. But in fact, paradoxically, what has happened with Brexit and the end, uh, exit of uh, uh, Britain from the, uh, from the European Union is that basically the United Kingdom has lost a lot of kind of contacts, lost uh, relevance on the international scene. And also the universities, I would actually submit because commercialism is the first thing that de decides, it doesn't actually deal necessarily, they do not actually deal, deal uh, necessarily with strategic, uh, strategic topics. I would, for instance, argue that um, there are, well, we all are following the uh, 
Russian aggression against Ukraine. Um, we also know that Poland and uh, Hungary, and to a lesser extent, uh, uh, countries, post-communist countries like the Czech Republic, are suffering with um, pop populism and kind of uh, uh, incipient authoritarianism, maybe. And um, under communism, uh, before 1989, uh, British universities knew f full well, and of course, commercialism still didn't kind of uh, sort of run these universities, that it was strategically important for the, for, for the uh, United Kingdom to uh, understand the hostile bloc of the uh, Soviet Union and its satellites. So actually, uh, the, the, these, these places was actually studied at British universities. Now, this seems to have basically gone, um, disappeared, and uh, Britain is self-obsessed with itself and its problems, and it has lost, um, it's, it's stopped being kind of a major international player. And, um, I mean, uh, the School of Modern Languages and Cultures in the United Kingdom, uh, at the University of Glasgow, for instance, has uh, concentrated only the larger uh, kind of uh, languages, like, say, French, Spanish, German, there is still Russian. They did, uh, I mean, the, 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 the uh, honors programs in, say, Polish, which is a country of 40 million people, um, was closed down, as was a similar program in the, the Czech studies. And again, I think this is this problem of commercialism. Uh, because um, classes which doesn't have uh, hundreds of students are regarded as uh, non-viable. And I, I repeat that I think it's a problem because uh, a self-respecting country should really be following its strategic interest and it should actually cultivate specialists who would be understanding what is happening in potential crisis centres in Europe and internationally at large. Yeah, and, and let's let, let's remember also that Polish is the second most spoken language in Scotland. It would be nice if some university was, was yes. teaching Polish. It's quite interesting that uh, universities kind of follow a certain amount of political correctness also. They talk about, they really uh, uh, spend quite a lot of time against racism, against Orientalism, wants to be very careful about possible kind of uh, ostracization of uh, students or problems from the third world. But unfortunately, this uh, sort of uh, um, same concern about uh, dealing with Central and East European Europe at British universities uh, on an equal footing seems to be missing. But of course... Uh, all this thing, this, this commercialism isn't affecting only uh, sort of, say, East European languages, but of course, um, uh, there are universities, some of the universities in England have really pro financial problems because uh, the collection of student fees does not always uh, work properly. And there are some universities that are kind of in the red. Yeah quite uh, substantially. And what happens is that there are tendencies in some universities to close down humanities subjects, uh, like, I don't know... Uh, even as the least profitable. Yeah. So, so it's a problem, and there, there are, of course, these pressures from uh, 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 ruling politicians to actually specialise in the technology at the expense of the arts subjects, and yet we all know that we do need to have arts subjects and the humanities to really understand <laughs> development and social sciences. It's not going to save us all if we only do engineering or large subjects like IT um, uh, for, for, for 400. Or, or the business management. Mm -hmm. yeah. And one other point uh, about this uh, Brexit thing, we still at uh, Glasgow University have quite a considerable number of students from the European Union. Now, I don't know how many people in England know or are aware of the fact that in Scotland, where education is devolved, undergraduate students do not pay student fees. 
only postgraduate students uh, pay student fees. I mean, local students, like sort of Scottish students, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, there used to be this law before before the, uh, the United Kingdom left uh, the European Union that uh, students from the European Union had to study both in England and in Scotland under exactly the same conditions that home students. So while universities of England charged students from the European Union to pay the same fees as the local English students have to pay at English universities, in Scotland, undergraduates from the European Union did not pay anything, right? Because uh, undergraduate study was free from... Uh, from uh, uh, local Scottish students. So the same applied to I, I students know, from I was the European one of them, Union. Yeah. However, after Brexit, this has been abolished and actually any foreign students now have to pay absolutely exorbitant fees because now uh, almost kind of, in a way, xenophobically, I don't think there's any other reason for this, uh, if overseas students are really paying much more than ten thousand uh, pounds, which is more than ten thousand uh, dollars U.S. dollars uh, uh, annually, and so basically, uh, those European Union uh, students will no longer be able to study at uh, Scottish universities for free after Brexit. They will be paying the same amounts, uh, the same fees as uh, as people from, say, Africa or China or what have you. And uh, basically, it just will block these people. And uh, yeah, and and actually, that's that was something I wanted to mention as well because uh, this is the one side to the story. But the other side of the story is that as Britain left uh, European Union, it also left the Erasmus program, even yeah. though it is not only for European Union countries, as you can be on Erasmus from yeah, this from is Serbia also outrageous. Other countries, yeah. It is absolutely yeah, and, yes, absolutely outrageous because this is one of the things which is which is really really important for student uh, students uh, throughout the European Union that they go and spend and time at other universities in other countries, and that has been deprived. Uh, I mean, uh, students in the United Kingdom have been, been absolutely deprived from it. Young people, of course, have been, due to Brexit, uh, deprived of the right to go and work in uh, European countries. It is outrageous, mm -hmm. yes. But, but, but this also leads to this, that uh, uh, the British academic community becomes like more isolated from yes. the, the rest of European academia because, uh, as you said, students are not coming here. Students are not going out on Erasmus. And also uh, all these exchange programs are drying up. So the academics uh, professors or something will be less likely to come to Britain now after Brexit because of all these university exchange programs being being cut. Cancelled. But there is also other problem to that because uh, as a student, as, as some of the listeners may, may don't know, but I was amongst other your, one of your students. And I always liked that in comparison to the Polish universities when I studied before that in the British universities, the professors and teachers are so uh, available for students. You can uh, just go to them and talk. You can meet them. I remember we were meeting in the pub after classes for some further discussions and we were always there for us to help or to give us some advice. And now, as you said, the, the universities are commercialized and uh, the funds are being uh, tightened there's this problem, especially with younger academics, like on PhD level or, 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 or slightly above, that they are really struggling to survive because they cannot get long-term contracts. They're constantly uh, struggling. They, 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 they are not paid well and they don't know if they will be employed next semester or something. And this also impacts the quality of teaching a lot, I think. Not to mention the strikes that were happening in Glasgow and in other universities for this very reason. So I would say that uh, this commerci commercialization of, uh, of the academia not only impacted uh, the, the teaching quality in the ways uh, we discussed already, but also in that the lower paid academics have no longer that much time to just simply be able to sit down and work with their students as they had before. 
And not to mention that uh, some of these most popular uh, degrees that are money makers for the universities are just overscribed, and you have just crowds of, of, of students at every lecture. And it's just impossible to have this one-to-one relations between the professor and the student anymore. Well, um, it is true that um, there are, uh, in British universities, but that has been a sort of ongoing problem, very uh, sort of underpaid, especially young lecturers, and it is really quite difficult. Uh, there are many lecturers who have short-term contracts and actually they have insecurity of employment. And this is why there are these, amongst other things, there are these ongoing strikes by the university uh, trade union because uh, the, the, the union demands that this should be improved. I do have to say that uh, British universities have been, on the whole, against Brexit. And Brexit for the UK universities is a really, really serious problem. Uh, Now, this, of course, uh, concerns maybe, uh, well, it it, it, uh, concerns, I mean, the international cooperation in research uh, uh, research programs. Uh, There is this problem that... uh, the Horizon program, which uh, uh, exists to enable uh, European and uh, uh, it used to be also UK academics to cooperate on uh, uh, sort of international grants. Uh, United Kingdom has been uh, excluded from it. And uh, one other thing, I'm talking from the, this point of view of of a school which is supposed to be teaching uh, European languages, and we have and we have had language lectors, uh, language uh, sort of teaching assistants uh, uh, coming to Glasgow University from various uh, uh, European countries like France, Spain, Portugal, Czech Republic. Now we do have, we do still do teach the Czech language, um, uh, and uh, we do get a Czech language lector from the Czech Republic, which is fully funded by the Czech government. Uh, Glasgow University doesn't doesn't spend a penny on this. But paradoxically, after Brexit, because exactly the salary of this Czech lector is paid by the Czech government, this is why the British Home Office doesn't allow this lector to come to this country and they will not give them the work permit. So I will not bother uh, uh, listeners to details about this. It was an incredible problem, which we really spent a lot of time to overcome this. And similarly, there have been problems with lectors from Spain, from France, from other countries, This is just one issue which uh, uh, Brexit has created insurmountable problems for UK universities, and it is a source of incredible frustration and wasting a lot of energy and time on trying to solve these problems. And I, I can think of one more thing as, as we, we touch on those like uh, unsecure, unsecure job and low payments for the PhD uh, lectures. I have some friends in Poland who are doing PhD studies, and of course, Poland is famous for not being the well-paying universities for for PhD students, but they make a living basically by uh, getting some research grants and doing some side projects, and they can make a decent living if they are working in some good uh, academic institution. But uh, for like British researchers, the source of European grants is now not accessible because of Brexit as well. So they cannot go down that route as the European colleagues can. Am I correct? Well, they have to... Uh, well, I mean, th- there are negotiations about that Horizon program, that, that grant-giving uh, European Union program. Maybe I think that there have been uh, some problems that this couldn't be sorted until... Uh, until the uh, problems with Northern Ireland between the United Kingdom and the European Union, you know, the borders and the checks uh, will be sorted. And so it it was, as far as I understand, it was kind of suspended, this negotiation. But hopefully, eventually, the, the, the United Kingdom will gain regain access to the, the, to the Horizon pro, pro, 
uh, program. But no, well, Brexit has created uh, serious problems and has basically thrown uh, British universities into into isolation. And of course, uh, supporters of Brexit kind of think that um, middle classes in the United Kingdom are the sort of um, sort of in a conspiracy against Brexit, all, all these people, all these kind of people who do not understand allegedly the ordinary people like in Northern, uh, Northern England who voted for Brexit. But of course, as I keep saying, as I keep repeating, certainly the, the British universities knew very well that uh, Brexit would be a disaster for them, and it is. Okay, I wanted to change the subject slightly and just uh, just to finish, ask you something like from the more the student perspective, because it is said that like if you are graduated from Oxford, you will have uh, no problems finding a good job and and so on. But the thing is that uh, British universities are like very classists and. I even observed that in Glasgow when uh, I was studying and working and some of my colleagues were spending half of the university time in students' union drinking beer, making connections. And even those who had much worse results than I had at the end uh, landed in some nice jobs uh, because they have connections, they knew people, they were from the class and so forth. So I'm, I'm not like complaining. I'm happy with my life, of course, but I'm just using that as an example. And... I was uh, to ask you like two questions. Uh, first is like how much the actual academic achievements matter and how much your connections you make during your university times matter for the student and, and future alumni of this um, most prestigious universities because I know some people who came for the exchange uh, year from Poland to Oxford or to Cambridge and I have to say they were really disappointed with quality of teaching really. And the second thing is, uh, this is my own observation but it's shared with uh, many of my Polish friends who also studied in Poland and in Britain. And as we see that, like... I, I studied physics and astronomy in Poland and then arts in Britain, so that's maybe an apple and oranges, but I know people who studied physics both in Poland and in Glasgow, for example, and they have the same observation that in Poland it's really easy to drop out from the university. If you are not good enough, you you just fail your exams and that's, that's the end of your studies. I started my astronomy stud- studies and there was 31 of us in, in the year and only one of my colleagues finished in time and uh, after one year there were only five left and then I dropped out and only four uh, left further. When in Britain, as I felt it, it's really hard to get a good degree. But if you are happy with your like D's or whatever, you can just sail through your university doing basically nothing and you will still be able to graduate. So would, would that be fair to say that only like the best degrees from the British universities really matter because you, you can just glide through through it doing nothing and still be able to finish? Well, I don't know whether this is not too critical. It is true that uh, maybe the uh, uh, role of uh, Oxford and Cambridge is slightly over-exaggerated. Uh, I would say that basically the quality of each university everywhere depends on the individual lecturers. And you do have good lecturers and not so good lecturers uh, in many universities. I don't, of course, know. I don't really, I'm not that kind of official. I don't know what happens with graduates. But one one uh, uh, interesting point may be dealing with students who used to be doing Czech studies. Not very many people know this, but uh, if you did uh, the Czech language or, or Czech studies, and you put this into your CV uh, when applying for jobs on graduation, it actually leads to people being successful in getting a job more easily because, strangely, um, the prospective employers appreciate that a student who does something within his university studies period, uh, something like sort of the Czech language or Czech uh, literature or whatever, that such a person is quite originally uh, original, that uh, it's uh, a person that shows 
independent thinking and that uh, uh, thinks out of the box, as it were. So that he will be uh, uh, an interesting contribution to any uh, uh, within any prospective job. So that seems to work basically. But many many students, of course, aren't aware of this. Britain is a class-ridden society, so it may well be that uh, some people will be more successful uh, when getting a job uh, because of, say, the connections of their parents or whatever. But uh, I have no experience of, of this. On the whole, our graduates have been quite successful in getting sort of employment, and uh, they come from all walks of life. Okay, so in general... We can say that uh, the British universities had problems even before Brexit, and they were mostly due to their commercializations. But now the the Brexit is really making everything harder for them. Would that be the right assessment? Well, it it is it has contributed to 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 the isolation of the whole country, and of course, Brit, uh, universities should be a major major kind of uh, I don't know. Asset within a country, and if if it uh, if if it is now more difficult to kind of uh, have contacts with the uh, European Union, uh, with places like I mean, there is this Erasmus. This applied oh, not only to students coming to uh, to Britain from European countries uh, for uh, study stays, but of course the other way about. There was also teachers' mobility. I have been going to uh, teach in Europe for many years, and this is via Erasmus. Uh, and this is obviously no longer possible. So it is it is a problem. And the other thing we're as, to recap is that, uh, and that may be my personal opinion, but uh, while some universities are coping uh, relatively well in attracting uh, student fees, especially inter- in international student fees, I do think that it is not a good idea to base the whole university system on this because, uh, as we said, uh, it uh, leads to the fact that uh, the managers of universities prioritize the issue of money before the issue of academic concerns. And look at Germany, for instance. Let's say that at the end, you can study for free in uh, German universities, even if you are a foreigner from abroad. Mm-hmm. Uh, Britain, eat your heart out. The Germans know very well how important tertiary university education is. And this is why... I'm, I'm, I'm now living in Helsinki and I'm literally bombarded with advertisements uh, on, on Facebook and on social media where universities invite me to study basically for free, do some courses or a PhD or something. They like actively advertise spending money to to bring me to them to study for free. So I guess they may understand that this is important, like not only as a money-making enterprise, but as like improving your country's academic uh, growth and, and uh, community by inviting foreigners to, to study. But just really to finish, uh, we try to finish every chapter of our podcast uh, with some advice for Britons what can be done to improve the, the subject of, of, of each chapter. And you already mentioned that, in your opinion, uh, basing universities on, on fee-paying students may be not the greatest idea. Can you think of anything else that would make British universities greater, better? Well, that there would be these contacts, uh, uh, international, which needs to be developed and reinstated. And I don't know whichever uh, party... <laughs> actually would actually support this and then of course unfortunately uh, britain is really uh, influenced by the situation in the united states and their uh, universities in the united states are uh, very commercial and uh, britain always kind of copies the united states not necessarily terribly successfully so uh, Briti- uh, american universities seem very powerful uh, the, the the pays are usually uh, fairly substantial but uh, again, there is this issue of commercialism as well, and uh, I don't, I can't see that any any political party in the United Kingdom would actually abolish this. It is good that in Scotland, as I keep saying, undergraduates don't pay any student fees, but uh, it is a disaster that uh, the European students can no longer really kind of study here. 
And of course, it has greatly enhanced the overall atmosphere when you have a class where I don't know what 30-40% of the students are students from the European Union, because you get in, in, in a sort of class discussions, you get these different views from different uh, cultures, and this is incredibly uh, useful. And uh, kind of uh, confrontation from different cultures brings new ideas, but of course, uh, that will no longer exist. I feel quite pessimistic about uh, any possibly positive changes in the United Kingdom. Basically, we can sum it up that if the British universities wants to be greater, they should look more into Europe, like Germany, Finland, and learn from there, less perhaps across the Atlantic. Thank you, Professor Chalik, for your time, and uh, you are listening to You Are Not So Great Britain. Thank you very much. Goodbye.